Good morning. How's everybody today? So I'm going to start off by telling a little story. Um, it's kind of a short story. So when I was younger, um, my dad would grocery shop once a month. Periodically, throughout the week, if he needed it, he'd get milk or bread or whatever, but typically once a month. And every time he came home, he brought all of his kids a bag of Nibs licorice. So it was something special. We looked forward to it. We got excited about it. If you brought it home every day, it would lose that value, it would lose that specialness to us. So that thing that was special would then become common. And I, I told this story just kind of, I like to have visual pictures of things, and I'm going to kind of relate it to love. So love, God created as something special. He created it, um, Jesus. Jesus is love. And the world today has made that something special and turned it common. Um, a few years ago, I have a family member who did something that um, they realized that they shouldn't have done it. It wasn't the best choice to have made. Um, and they came up to me and they made this comment that really hurt. Not me, I mean, it hurt me personally, but it hurt because this is the way the world views love. She said, do you still love me? Or better yet, she said, do you hate me now? Um, it's sad that the world sees love as something that can be taken and given so randomly that it, it, um, I can just snatch it off, off of you or snatch it away from you. And it's something that God is love and God is power. So love was meant to create change in our lives. And um, the way the world views it, it does not create that change in our lives. And so I just want to encourage the church to... Um, to step out in God's love and not worldly love and change the view that the world has on love and get it back to where it needs to be as it's something special and something important. Um, and so I just want to pray, Father God, that you work on each one of our hearts, Father God, and you begin to show us what your love truly and honestly looks like, God. You loved us when we were sinners, but you didn't love us so that we could say, stay sinners. Your love gave us the power to get out of that mess that we had gotten ourselves into, Father God, and create a relationship back to you, Father God. So I just pray that each one of us here, Lord, learns to love how you love, Father God, that our love goes out with power, and it um, goes out and changes the lives of the people that we come in contact with, the people that we know, just the, the, the world around us, that we can change the view on love, Father God. Thank you. So before we actually start worship, we have a birthday. <laughs> My cousin Taylin is 22. And so if you guys don't mind, we're actually gonna sing him happy birthday before we start. Happy birthday to
help us to love the way you love and help us to continue to do that through this day and this week, Lord.
Father, we do thank you for this morning, God. God, we do pray with uh, with what Manda said, Lord, about love, God. We uh, you know, Jesus asked the question, who who would love more, the one that's forgiven a little or who was forgiven much? And the guy says, uh, suppose the one that he forgave more. And that's a correct answer, but all of us, we can say, you know, I'm not that bad of a person, but it doesn't matter. My, my best is, is rags before you. Regardless how good of a person somebody might think they are, they still deserve hell. Father, so if we realize and grab a hold of, uh, you might think, I'm a good person. But God, I still needed forgiveness. I still needed the cross. Christ still had to pay that price regardless how good of a person I feel like I am. So we've all been forgiven of so much. God, so help us get a, I don't know, on my heart, Father, get a hold of that, Lord. Get a hold of what you've done for us. Father, we just thank you for this morning, God. Lord, we do take a moment to lift up Pastor Lance and Quinn and 
Jared and Gabby on their trip, little road trip. It's not often they get to get away. Lord, so we just pray that you bless them while they're out, Lord, that you would continue to open doors for them. Father, give them divine appointments. Lord, so we just thank you and praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I'm preparing here, um, Bailey has an envelope with a, a, a word in it, and uh, you guys don't have to take it out unless you want to. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I was uh, prompted to print it and uh, pass it out, so... I almost need a table up here for all these books. <laughs> it's a wonderful day. As a parent, it's always nice to, well, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of bittersweet seeing your kids get another year older, and, but it's a blessing. Taylor's birthday today. So I'm going to start reading this. I, the Lord, am good. Yes, I am, am good far above the heavens. No one is as good as I, the Lord. So when I warn of a great war coming, do not distance yourself or run. For I, the Lord, am good. You are called to stand, arm yourself. I never called my people to run in defeat. If you turn and run, you will never stop running. <clears throat> You will never find rest. But if you arm yourself and move into battle with me, the creator, I assure you, you will find the peace and rest in the middle of the war. I will not leave or abandon you. I am a good God. If a man will not leave his child to be destroyed, then how could I, your heavenly father, leave my children? And with me, I am on your side, you have all power needed, yes, far above what you need, to be victorious in any battle to come. Yes, there is more than one, but I, the Lord, am not a battery that needs recharged. Yes, I can do it all at the same time and not break a sweat. It is time to break out of the, old, out of the mold that the church has created. I, the Lord, never made the church to be a safe place to retreat but a force carrying my power to overthrow the wickedness in the world. There are people wandering in the wilderness that are lost in, in the enemy's camp, but they are not lost to me. No, in fact, I, the Lord, can see them just fine. And my gaze is moving from my church to the lost and wanderers. And my forces, my church, should get focused on my gaze. Yes, the battle is for souls. It is not for more belongings, money, or land. I, the Lord, own everything, all the universes, and whatever I decided to put in them are mine. Yes, the galaxies are under my ownership and subject to my will. But surely I say unto thee, nothing matters except souls of creation. Yes, I, the Lord Jesus Christ, bought all souls and I, the Lord, require my church to bring me a harvest. This is the battle. This is the war. Do not be overtaken because of some sickness, riots, politics. My church is not to be short or narrow-sighted. I, the Lord, say, save souls. Yes, freely receive and freely give. Are you not a carrier of my spirit? He does the work. Share my gospel and watch him work before your eyes. Do not be disbelieving, but believing. Get your eyes off yourself and seek out the lost. Follow my gaze. 
For if your eyes are not on yourself and doing what I want, then I, the Lord, will take care of you. But if you keep your gaze on yourself, then you will fight your own battles by yourself. And I will wait until you've had enough and do things my way. Stay focused on me and what I'm doing. I, the Lord, will take care of you. Again, I am, am a good father. So when I read that, uh, I felt like the Lord took me to, to this passage of Scripture. And um, I'm going to start in Mark 4. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, a, a background here. This is just right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, <clears throat> he just, uh, he's been doing a lot of, He's just started into the healing. He's he did the the B attitudes. He's he's getting popular. He's kind of uh, you know he's he's I don't know what you would call it. He's the the thing of the day. You know, um, you know the Pharisees don't like him because he's stolen all of their fame. Um, you know, so he he's the happening guy, and he's just uh, picked the picked his disciples. It's like the day before this. And so you can imagine what his disciples are thinking. I mean, the man of the hour has arrived, and I'm one of the 12. You know, they're probably a little built up, you know, probably thinking they're actually really something. Um, You know, they probably really think there's something because it was just, uh, again, just right before this, um, you know, that his mother and brothers come and they say, hey, your mother and brothers are outside and they're wanting to see you. And he and he looks at his disciples at the table and he says, these are my mother and brothers. So, you know, he's uh, they probably feel like, man, he's put me as on the same playing field as as his own family. So. It's just kind of funny. I, I don't know. I don't know why I was really thinking that, but just the what his disciples must be thinking in that moment is it's really easy to get carnal minded in, in something like that when you think you're getting promoted or something that you're you're actually real special. And I'm not saying that to God you are very special, but sometimes you can kind of get your flesh into that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to actually start reading in... Mark 4, I'm going to start reading in 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat, as he was, and other little boats were, with, with, were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat. In, into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and buked the wind and the sea and said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fear fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And said to one, one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, going back to the disciples again, you know, you could, everybody was looking for this, the, the Savior of Israel. They thought that the Messiah was going to free them from the rule of the Romans. They, they thought he was going to show up and overthrow the Roman Empire. And, uh. So, you know, after, so seeing everything that Jesus was doing, all of the, the miracles and, um, and uh, calming the seas, you know, you could think that this for sure is the guy because with all of this kind of power, he can surely overthrow the Romans.
And I'm going to go ahead and just keep on reading a, a little bit and uh, right at the next chapter, chapter 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with chains and shackles, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken to pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. You know, it's, when I read this, it was really, you know, it kind of hit me hard. The, the bondage this person in is in, and not just the demonic bondage, but the bondage that, you know, cutting himself with, with stones. Well, the stone is the old law. That's symbolic of the old law. He was guilty of the law, and he deserved death. And, and the mankind, the ones that could help him, the only help they offered him was more bondage. They just tried to chain him up. The, he, he wasn't getting any help. He wasn't, uh, and this hit me a little bit hard when I read this, is the only place he felt like home was with the dead, When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you, you by God, that you do not torment me. <clears throat> so when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. That was not the demon running to Jesus to worship. It was the last little bit of, of sanity, if you want to call it that, in the man that he had, knowing that he needed to get to somebody that would help him. And he recognized Jesus, not necessarily who he was as the Messiah, but he recognized him. There was something different about him that he knew that if he could get to that man, they wouldn't try to put a chain on him, that there was something he was carrying that could help him. You know, again, with what Manda was saying, what, once we start loving like we should, there'll be something about us that you won't have to, you won't have to go evangelize. You won't have to go actually look for somebody to minister to. It's going to happen all the time. Every time you go to the grocery store, every time you go to the gas station, every time you go to work, it's just going to be happening because there's something different about you. And when I, when, I was fin when I finished reading this, I, I felt like the Lord asked me, he said, Leland, what, what are you willing to do to reach the one soul? And uh, I didn't quite understand the question at the time, but he was like, I, I went on a boat across the a sea, knowing a storm was going to hit, possibly lose my life, left all the popularity on the other side of the sea, Everybody, I mean, I was the man over there. The people in the boat, the disciples, sometimes we have people in our boat that don't belong there. This is a rabbit trail, I know it, but it just come to me. Sometimes we have people in our boat that is unwilling to they're not willing to go as far as you are to reach that soul, and they will hold you back. But are you willing to leave all the popularity, willing to uh, leave what, what is the, the big and new thing of the day? Leave friends and family, loved ones. What are you willing to do to reach the one soul? You know, he, you 
you know, I know we've COVID's been hit a couple times in the, in the last weeks, you know, but again, I want to assure you that that would not slow Jesus down. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even be a speed bump. And I know that because he went up to a leper, which was a whole lot, leprosy is a whole lot more contagious than COVID. They separated the lepers. They made them live in a, 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 an area outside of town all by themselves because it was so, I mean, if you touched anything, you touch their clothes, you touch anything, you have it. I mean, it's a very contagious. And a leper came to him and said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was like, I'm willing. And he reached out and touched him. Before he was healed, he reached out and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. So sickness doesn't slow Jesus down. So, um, I'm gonna keep reading. Mark 5, I'm going to, let's see, start up in 18. So after this, you know, I'm not going to just keep reading the the whole scripture, but, you know, after this, you know, Jesus, he cast the demons out. The guy set free, you know, the demons go into swine. They run down the hill. The people of that area, um, they don't want Jesus to to come into the towns. They're fearful, so he um, is getting ready to depart. So in verse uh, 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged, begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim, proclaim it in Decapolis, all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. So Decapolis, and I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but uh, when you break it down, the beginning part of that is 10, and the last part is cities. It's not just a town, it's an area, a region. And one man went and turned that whole region upside down. I think sometimes Jesus is wanting that uh, uh, that wild sheep in the flock, you know, sheep. They just kind of follow the shepherd, and I don't know a whole lot about sheep, but what I hear is like if they they run out of water in this field, they're not going to go find any water. They'll just sit there and thirst to death and die, and that's kind of what <laughs> what the church is is, you know, called as you know the the flock, the sheep, and and we all know that. You know, we need Jesus to lead us, but I think through this, sometimes uh, uh, Jesus is looking for that one, I don't know, I just kind of had a picture of it, you know, just because being around animals and stuff when I was younger, you know, sometimes there's a, you're sitting there watching uh, whatever herd, whether it be horses or cows or, you know, any of them, and you're sitting there and you can be watching them and one of them will just start bucking and kicking and, you know, they're just messing around, but sometimes God is wanting one wild sheep in the flock because one wild sheep focused in the right direction will turn 10 cities upside down. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to flip over to Luke chapter 8. This is the exact same story different author. So Luke 8, 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And that caught me, you know, I was trying to figure out what, what passage I was going to read, Mark or Luke, and I like the way that Luke kind of ended this um, in a way that I shouldn't say I liked it. It was actually quite discouraging. I never picked this up till just uh, last night, actually. Uh, you know, 
Jesus left a multitude that loved him, but they was not doing anything. They were following him around like a bunch of, I guess, lost sheep. And, and that's it's great if that's where you're at, but he would leave all that popularity and all that fame and everybody wanting to, to see more, to, to see more signs to, and, and to see him walk on water and do all these things and see all sorts of miraculous and then ask him, hey, if you're the Messiah, we need a sign. You know, to me, that's, hello? I mean, to me, that's like, you know, cleansing lepers, the, the lame getting up and walking, and, and you're wanting to see a sign? Uh, I mean, what calms the sea? Uh, I mean, what else? I, mean, I don't know. That's just me. What else do you want to see? I, I don't know. I, but, um, but he would leave all that to reach the one that is willing to be out changing people's lives. Jesus only spends a couple hours with them. He's not even there a day. Turns the guy's life upside down, sets him free, talks to him for two hours and sends him out. Don't think that there's anybody here that's unable to witness to somebody. It doesn't require much. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. They wasn't accomplishing anything. All they wanted to see was more. That's why Jesus left that, that group of people, because he needed to get to somebody that would make something happen, that would start advancing the kingdom of God, and then come back and they're still all still there waiting. It was kind of a, I don't know, it was just a little bit of an eye opener for me that God is wanting us to really start, I don't know, sharing the love of God and not just being spectators, not just being I don't know, Hold, doing this because I get a get out of hell free card. I got my fire insurance. There is a world out there that doesn't have their fire insurance. And I kind of say that jokingly, fire insurance, but just because it's kind of a, a little bit of a, of a heavy topic. It's a very short message today. But really, I want to really, what Jesus was doing for me was really causing me to think a little bit. Leyland, what, the, the exact question he asked me is, what are you willing to do for one soul? What are you willing to do? You, you willing to risk it all? You willing to possibly lose your life? You willing to be uh, shunned from family and friends? What are you willing to do? And, uh, you know, I had to question my, uh, I don't know, I had to question my love of the lost. Because when the rubber meets the road, I'm probably not as good as Jesus in that area. That's, you know, probably for sure. I'm working on it. Lord will, and he'll continue to work on me. But that's a, that's it. I mean, we're, there's, I don't know, kind of with what Quinn was talking about last week and stuff. I mean, the time's coming. I mean, what, what, what's the church going to look like here in another few months? What, uh, where are we going to be? Are we going to be back in the building? Are we going to be here? Are we going to, you know, what, it, what is it? And are, are we willing to allow that to completely, uh, stop us advancing the kingdom of God. I don't know how it all looks. We're still continuing to pray for answers and believing that when the time comes and when things change, you know, we'll know which direction to go. But 
uh, I feel like God's really wanting the church to get ready because like in that word, it says his gaze is on the lost and the wanderers. And uh, so that's it. Helen, do you have anything? So the, you guys can come up, Taylor, if you wanted to play a little something or or Jaden, either, either one. Well, Father, Lord, we come before you, God, and uh, God, I know I'm the first to say I'm convicted in the way that I continue to find that uh, as good of a person I think I am or what I think I have become, that I am still nothing like Jesus. And Lord, my heart's desire is I would be, or I would always have the mind of Christ. That I would not let circumstances, circumstances or situations affect my decisions or who I am willing to reach out to. Or ever throw up judgment on somebody just because I know of something they've done or who they used to be. God, I just pray that you would uh, help us keep this flesh under check. God, because it's not your spirit in us that's uh, saying those things. Father, I just pray that uh, once again, our hearts would be broke for the lost. That's what the church is to be doing. Reaching the hurting. The church doesn't have to grow. You know, that one guy that Jesus reached and set out, changed 10 cities, but never was a follower or he was a follower of Jesus, but he didn't just follow him around. We don't necessarily need more people in the pews. We just need some more wild sheep. Father, so I just, uh, I do pray that uh, you would just stir us once again, Lord, that uh, we would not become, I don't know, uh, stagnant. But Father, that, uh, well, that you would stir us, but the word also says to stir yourself. God, and that's what I feel like I'm, you're, you're stirring me some to stir myself. God, and you, I could see that as correction, but God, I really just see it as a good thing. God, I don't want to miss any open doors to encourage, to uplift, to pray with people. God, I don't want to miss any of them. God, so I just pray, Lord, that uh, your church would be sensitive, Holy Spirit, to what you're wanting to do through us. God, so I thank you for this morning, Father. I just pray blessings on, again, Pastor Lance and Quinn, and uh, Father, give them a wonderful trip. Lord, to, your favor is always with us, God. We have Jesus, so we have your favor. There's not separating that. God, but again, your blessings follow your people this week, God, and help us to be um, sensitive to your spirit when you open the doors for us, even if it's something small. Lord, there's nothing too small. Sometimes the smallest things have the 
huge impact. God, so we don't, uh, we don't look over anything, if, even if we do think it's small, Lord. God, we just thank you and bless you this day. Father, be with us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week, a wonderful long weekend. Hopefully you guys have a long weekend.